um, this year. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So to kick things off, right? What we are hoping to do through this panel discussion is to help uh, most of you to understand the different roles that are out there with regards to data. Okay, and also what kind of skills and knowledge uh, that you should be getting or uh, try to get in order to score interview and even score a position uh, in that particular role. So that will be the main uh, focus of what the panel discussion will be. So uh, feel free to ask questions that's related to those uh, pointers that I mentioned. So without much further ado, let me introduce the uh, panelists first. So our first uh, panelist is Eugene. Uh, who's a data scientist from UK.ai. So uh, his role is data scientist, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I must make sure everyone knows that data scientist role. Okay, next we have uh, Janet. Janet is from uh, NTUC. So uh, he's actually currently a machine learning engineer in uh, NTUC. Uh, next, so uh, so round of applause for Janet, please. Can you win, please? <laughs> okay, next we have uh, Michael from Agilent. So Michael is actually a business intelligence and data analyst from uh, Agilent. So a round of applause for him, please. And uh, last but not least, we have Weina. Weina from Rakuten, who's a research scientist uh, over there. Um, so actually, we really do look forward to having more uh, ladies from in the panel. Uh, but for now, we can only find one. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, I think you do work on it, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, so without much further ado, let's, let's start the panel first. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll take a seat. So a round of applause for me, please. Yeah. Okay. okay. And what about yourself? Who are you, Ku? Oh, Ku, uh, I'm the moderator for today. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm actually a. Uh, Data Science and Analytics Instructor uh, over here. I'm also the uh, co-founder for Data Science SG together with Kai Sing right over there. So uh, today we sort of scissors paper stone, so I become the moderator and he operates the style over there. Yeah. So <laughs> in any case itself, uh, yeah, let's start the ball rolling. So I think for the first question, same thing. So what we will what we'll ask for the panelists like, is, can you describe your role? What's your day to day? Uh, what does it entail? Uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So I think for the start, maybe that... Eugene? Yeah. Okay, I think this is a common question that you get when you are, other people are interviewing for your company. I, I, I usually say that I like to try, try to spend 50% of my time writing code, looking at the data. 20% uh, of the time, I do research, like read up-to-date papers, try to apply it. 20% um, of the time, I do uh, what we call leadership activities like budgeting, resource planning, hiring, and 10% of the time I do external communication. Um, like this counts as one, communicating other clients counts as one, uh, talking with potential investors or trying to get incentives counts as one as well. So that's why I do half technical, half non technical. Okay. Got it? So my role is mostly technical. I work. Uh, Today with data scientists, most of the work is about uh, taking the models that they have built and taking them in production. The previous role when I was a data engineer, it was almost always development. So uh, half of the day either it goes in development, and the rest of rest half of the day is usually debugging. Right? So uh, just monitoring your workflows. If something has failed, then do call analysis, try to find the right fail, try to find the bug fix. Very closely related to be a backend engineer or whatever sort of engineer. Right, Michael. Yeah. Can this be? Okay. Uh, so, so my daily job is um, mainly business intelligence. So, what we do is um, looking at dashboards, making sure it runs, designing those dash dashboards, and making sure that people who get it get actionable insights. You don't want like thousands of charts and no one gets anything out of it. So. A lot of it is making sure those charts actually mean something to someone and it's relevant to read it. Um, on the other half, when things go right, uh, what we are also looking at is uh, solving business problems. Sometimes they have questions about, hey, I don't have this objective, I want to get this, what's happening here? 
uh, we basically crack over the data set. We have to um, look at what are the trends out there and analyze and, and basically give our recommendations through there. So usually a lot of delivery through PowerPoints, you might have to give some uh, presentations to senior management once in a while. Uh, on the other hand, we also look at how we are also trying to improve um, our internal processes so that we get better data quality and we also try to educate a little bit of the users who are using our dashboards and making sure that they, they know how to use our stuff and they know how to read those charts properly. Okay, so uh, I'm a data scientist. Uh, I work in uh, RIT Singapore. Uh, so my uh, my daily work is uh, so the, so the working time is from nine to six. So a bit flexible, uh, but my my working is just to uh, write some code for data manipulation. Uh, then I get back. Then I, I I haven't heard those guys talk about machine learning models, and I feed the data to the machine learning models, and I, I get back. <laughs> I evaluate my results during all those process that, that I have to get back. So uh, it sounds like I'm a software engineer. Um, maybe it's a, also a good chance for me to take a step back to explain what is a data scientist, a machine learning scientist uh, working um, process. Uh, first of all, you have to get a kickstart of your project. So it's either the um, I think um, some some business they have the problem they have some issue they want your help so they will come to ask you mm -hmm. or you have some awesome idea that you can bring some profits or uh, make some uh, great impact to those business then that's a kickstart of the projects you can start then uh, the step one is you get the data from the data engineer team uh, those things are relatively clean they, they have clean for you that you just get access get the permission to use their data. And then the second step is to uh, try to clean the data again, to fit your format, uh, check your machine learning model, then fit that format. Then the step, step three is to clean your machine learning models and evaluate the results. If you feel confident enough, then you go to step four. <laughs> then you have to make some uh, good enough, at least a good enough visualization to talk with those uh, stakeholder from the different, uh, from all the relevant businesses. So if uh, maybe they need to take some uh, uh, corresponding uh, reaction, then you have to push them to take the action. Then step four, to, uh, step two to four is uh, is a loop. You have to do it a few times until you can really go to the final step to deploy your model. Uh, so that's a day to day job. Maybe the project may take like a few months, but you just don't have to follow this process. Thank you. Thanks, sorry. Uh, thanks, Mina. Okay, um, I saw the first question up there, right, is what do you feel is the most valuable skill for your role? But let me add a, let, add a small twist to that. So, um, in your day-to-day, -day, okay, in your day-to-day, -day, right, uh, what is the skill or knowledge that you use quite often? And also, um, does your undergrad, does whatever that you have learned in your undergrad years like helped as well? Okay, so maybe Jackie want to go first? Yeah. So the most useful skill is programming. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And yes, so my, uh, my undergraduate was in uh, information technology. Okay. So whatever I learned is still useful there. I spent a bit extra time playing a lot with Linux, so that has helped a lot. What was your first programming language then? I started with C, then Java, uh, then I learned Python on my own. After that I worked in assembly for a while, working on routers and stuff, then came back to Java. So after then it's mostly Java, SQL or Python. Okay, sometimes we use Scala if it's Scala related. Okay, before we move to another panelist, right? Because let, let's let's go with that. Because uh, I do get a lot of people asking me the question, hey, uh, if I actually have some programming background, let's say in Java or whatever, is it easier for me to move to other languages? What's your what's your thoughts on that? So if you know Java, you can very easily work with C sharp mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even JavaScript. So all these languages which do memory management for you. 
going to C or C++ may be a bit challenging because you need to manage the memory on your own. Uh, but the complete like the paradigm shift comes when you go to functional languages. Yeah, so you need to yeah. retrain yourself. Yeah. SQL also, I would say SQL is quite different compared to Java. Hello. Yeah, I see you can't escape from programming. So to be a data scientist or to work with data, you need to be well programmed to use the data. So maybe I won't talk on that as much. I think Jadid uh, mentioned that a lot. I think one thing we do a lot is logic and reasoning. For example, let's say someone comes to you with a problem like, okay, can we try to increase conversion or increase sales on the website? Uh, what do you mean by increase sales? Is it revenue per card or is it lifetime revenue? Or is it revenue per day? Um, which one of these metrics actually drive business output? So that's not something that you often see in an online course. You have a lot of technical courses on machine learning and optimizing, but no one actually teaches you how to choose the right metric. Yes, it's RMSE, but at the day level, at the card level, at the lifetime level, session level, whatever. So I think logic and reasoning plays a part, as well as statistics. Um, so that's uh, what I feel. So um, managing dashboards, you basically need a very, very good understanding of SQL or SQL um, because you're getting, if in, in most cases, um, someone else is feeding you that data and you basically need to understand really clearly what the data is, where it comes from and manage your queries uh, because you're basically pulling those in. And you, a lot of times you have to troubleshoot. And my experience with most VI or uh, software across different companies is that they always would say that their query language is somewhat near SQL. So if you learn SQL, you could slowly pick up a few other ones. Like uh, ClickSense, the, the query language is roughly similar, for example. So, so that one is a foundation. You make sure you can pull the data whenever you need it. The other part is that sometimes you get ad hoc requests that are unexpected. Um, so a little bit of automation, scripting, or macros helps a long way. So for example, someone recently asked us something, hey, I need this uh, data. And luckily with a macro, we ran it over nine for 36 hours, and we got the data. But if it was, if you did it by hand, good luck. <laughs> right, so, so that's the basic fundamental skills. You need to be very good at managing the data and getting the data at efficiently, right? So that's the first step. The other step is that as visualization is, is very key, right? It's basically a little bit of design so and communication. So, so luckily what I did back in uh, my business degree is I majored in marketing and also did uh, operations. So that helps, that, that really helps because I, it tells you like how you should you communicate a certain message. Uh, the most key part is that you need to understand what the challenges the business is facing so if they say cross profit, you better not go, what's cross profit? <laughs> That's not the right answer, right? So, so you need basic uh, business fundamentals to start answering the, con the questions that come because you're basically the consultant. You're the guy who are sitting on treasure trove of data, right? So you basically have to answer those questions quite carefully. Um, so that's the other side of, of the deal. You forgot to share what's your background, your undergrad? Um, yeah. So I don't come from a technical background. My background is actually in psychology. That hammered in stats and human behavior to me. So I find that you know that's actually fairly useful now. Nonetheless, uh, the programming part, I picked up on my own. So fairly decent at it, I guess. Good enough to be employed. Yeah. Same. <laughs> so um, actually, that's what I was saying. I chemistry. Um, so by that time, I had to do some hands-on uh, chemistry uh, experiments in the lab. Um, later on, I moved to the computation of chemistry, so uh, at that time, I completely uh, carried on uh, um, some other um, languages. So uh, by the time I moved to my but even I'm a chemist, uh, I still learn C so for a few years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's like quite, quite intensive later on for my job. Um, what I learned from the bachelor, what skills from your bachelor <laughs> helps in your current role? Um, yeah, just as a coding skill and some, some of the way that you have to think uh, the, the research mindset. I think that's useful. Uh, and currently in my day-to-day -day work, uh, I have to 
use Python. Uh, for Python library, you can call uh, the most useful library I found is Pandas um, for data manipulation. Uh, Matplotlib for visualization to show the stakeholders what you've done. Some other things are just a basic understanding of the machine learning, all the machine learning models are also useful because that's just your day-to-day -day work. You use them all the time. So, so, so to summarize this uh, logic, business thinking, statistics, and um, I think the common theme over here is programming, right? All of you have been mentioning that you, you program a lot. So I, I'm going to ask uh, for the rest of you who, who may have that question, and that is how do you all learn your programming? And was it tough learning the programming? And is there any learning tips that you have picked up? to learn uh, programming that you can share with the audience. So I, let's start with Michael. Let's start with Michael. <laughs> Sorry. Man. Yeah, so, so coming from a business degree, I definitely did learn any programming. Um, so, okay, maybe, okay. A little bit is, okay, you might not count this as programming, but we, I basically dabble a little bit with Excel VDA, so that helps a little bit. You create a little bit of macros to save some time. Um, that helps a little bit, but a lot of it is self-trained. Um, for example, uh, one of my job back then, I actually didn't know SQL when I graduated. So, so one of the internships I got is like, we need you to learn SQL. Okay, uh, learn SQL in two weeks. <laughs> There's online trainings with it, and once you are capable to do the queries, you know how it works. That's enough for you to branch off. And then from that point onwards, I started picking up R or Python both ways. In the same way. So. You, you get to at least know how to handle the files, how to do certain basic actions. So from that point on, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so I turn, um, uh, I think uh, learning the coding is easy, even if you don't have a computer science background. Um, there are some like Python in three months, um, Python from scratch, um, or um, Python for total beginners. Uh, those kind of course, uh, just to follow some of them, and uh, check the review score. If the score is high, I think it's effective. You just learn and follow the steps. Um, first, print Hello World, and just to do some <laughs> structures. And I mean, it, it's easy uh, because you, you don't need to learn, for me, for my role, you don't need to learn all the functions uh, or uh, all the things you can do with Python. You just need to learn all the related, related things with the machine learning models. Um, so don't spend too much time uh, on learning those. It's, it's a tool, so I hope everyone can find it easy and just, uh, I mean, if there's only one machine learning, um, uh, one coding uh, language for me to recommend is a Python for, for my role. Please. So as I mentioned, I started with C, which is uh, uh, like a brutal choice for a first language. <laughs> Uh, so, it's very unforgiving, right? So, uh, as soon as you start writing anything fancy you want to do, you run into a segmentation fault. Right? So, uh, I think it was the first course in my college, and we had like 50 assignments in C. <laughs> so, almost like two or three assignments per week. And wow, okay. I think by the 10th or 15th assignment, I got the hand of it. Okay. <laughs> but the good thing is, once you to see after that other language is quite easy. <laughs> okay. So 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 the conclusion for me will be lots of practice. Yes. yes. Right. Uh, force yourself to actually have like three assignments a week. So three. Uh, the magical number is three assignments per week. Okay. Programming. Okay. Yeah. Think more of that. Uh. Okay. Eddie. Uh, there is. I don't know the, uh, the creator of jQuery, John Resig. Uh -huh. He has a saying which says, uh, "You must try code every single day. Push something to GitHub every single day." And he okay. still does that. So three assignments, push codes to GitHub every day. Every day, right? Every day, yeah. Every day, I think it's better, like, at least it's not every hour. <laughs> okay, good. Eugene? Yeah, cool, cool will be watching your GitHub repo. Just <laughs> so I think my first language was R. I did stati uh, psychology, we ran a lot of experiments, mostly st statistical programming language is R. Who here started with R? Wow, okay, not that many, I guess it's not so popular now. Then. I did some machine learning competitions, I ran into some problems with R. So I moved on to Python. Then um, in my one of my roles, we 
had to use Spark, and we decided that we'll use Scala Spark because the Python API wasn't so developed then, so we used Scala. I think I was fortunate to be able to apply this on my work every single day. So I think the, the, the key thing that Jali mentioned was after the 15th assignment, you, you get over it. So I think uh, there's really no getting away other than just practice, practice, practice until you just drill it into your head. Um, some people are more talented than others, some people learn faster than others, but I think everyone here probably has a good enough learning rate. What's left remaining is just the discipline and the effort you put in to really get through it. I think it's not difficult at all, just like what Reina said. Okay. So, so maybe I'll add something. Sure, go. Google and Stack Overflow is your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, a lot of people think that, oh, I need to learn exactly the entire package or uh, the entire Python. But um, a lot of times, I think you overestimate how common your problem is. <laughs> like, usually most of your problems, someone has that problem before. So as long as you get the basic foundations up, right? Um, you can, on the way, you can learn a lot more from working online. So Stack Overflow and uh, Google, Google, yeah. <laughs> okay. So anything. Okay. <laughs> so now, so now you know why we why we bought the panel over at Google over here. Yeah. Okay. Um. I think that's it's time for us to open the open to the floor. Any questions from the floor? Okay. Oh, I I have to turn my head right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Okay, um, actually I'm monitoring this, so let, 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 let's, let's continue then. Um, I think all, all, profession, all professions will have uh, boring days and uh, exciting days. So um, can you all describe what's the most boring part of your work and what's the most exciting part of your, part of your work? Um, I, I just want to warn you all, it's recorded, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe Reina, you want to start first? Maybe I start from the, uh, what is the most boring day? Uh, the, because I don't have a com uh, computer science background, so uh, for computer uh, hardware things, I'm not good at. Uh, for example, recently I had to uh, install some something named Apex. <laughs> Apex for, for uh, parallel running on my, uh, some of my package. So that really is my biggest headache and troublemaker. I've been struggling with, with this for one day, then I, I didn't get any clue. So uh, I think the uh, I'm short of those uh, knowledge. So when I'm uh, when I can't get really the model to run, and uh, I know that myself have to catch up on a lot of those background knowledge about computer science, um, I feel a bit bored. So boring is not about you have nothing to do with, but you know you have to do something, but you have to achieve something challenge, really challenging, but you have no way to, to go there quickly. You have to learn, settle down to learn slowly. And the most ex exciting thing is just uh, when when you have some good result, and uh, when you read some news report about a new machine learning model that uh, can achieve so much more, and you just uh, think about the future, you feel so good about mankind. Wow. Thanks. Uh, so good about mankind, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, just like like the feeling about the future. Okay. Michael. Yeah. So so most boring, I guess, is uh, because I guess most companies have a, a huge array of, of data sources, and once in a while you come to those days that uh, is there any way we can extract this better? No. Okay, we got to split up the work. You take one to five, I take six to ten, you take the eleven to fifteen, and then we split up the task and just get a heads into it. So there is times that you, you have to get down to, to take the data out or you basically saying that okay we need this deck, it's huge, but we have to make sure that the whole deck is really correct because not a single number can be wrong out there. So you you put down some music and then you make sure you have focus and you bury your way through it. But the exciting part I guess is at the end. So the most of the exciting parts is at when, as a business data analyst, is when you work through your problem statement with uh, the, the problem statement of the stakeholders that you're working with, and then you go through the entire process saying that, okay, this is your problem, this is what the data says, and the exciting part is when they really tell you that, hey, we did this business decision based on your data and you know, insights, and that really works, and that, that is what, I guess, gives the best excitement. Right. So it's, it's really exciting to, to know that your work has been put to uh, use, 
and, and that has created a different somewhere. Impactful. Impactful. Yeah, okay. Then? So I agree with him. Sometimes uh, SQL can get really boring. You know, like uh, you're just writing a job, selecting like 100 columns from a table. You're just doing column 1 to column 100. Then you run it and then you see, I think you missed column 99. Right? Yeah. And then you have to go and look through all the lines of code one by one again. So that can get really boring in question if they were better to do this. <laughs> no, that is <laughs> Exciting is usually uh, you get to learn, uh, you always get something new to learn. And there's a lot of new stuff which keeps happening. Uh, every like every few months there is something new, also software or something which, is, which keep gets uh, released. So you just keep in track with that and see if that can improve our processes. You can use that so that part is really exciting. What really drives us is that when something we build or something I build um, is put into production, um, and then we get feedback from the user, hey, you know, this is actually really useful, and this is how we can improve it further. I mean, it's similar to what Michael said, the fact that something we built is delivering value, improving someone's lives, especially uh, I work in healthcare, that is very exciting for us, so that is the finish line. The finish line is not when the model is designed, the finish line is not when, the finish line is when, okay, they said, let's go to production, and then the second finish line is someone actually use it, give you feedback. Um, that to me is the most exciting part of every project. Now the most boring part is documentation. <laughs> so uh, it's something that's absolutely important. I try to do after every 20 days of uh, real work, um, I spend a day or two summarizing all my thoughts in documentation, updating my doc strings, writing test cases. <laughs> Um, but it's absolutely important if not, if you revisit the project six months from now or someone jumps onto your project trying to contribute, they wouldn't know where to start. And that prevents you from scaling. So by documentation, after writing it for more than two days, you start to get tired and you just want to write code that runs. That runs, yes. Okay. Um, Wait, okay, so that's what, one thing that I noticed was that there was, uh, I think the part about uh, learning, the part about learning where that's the exciting part, like for instance, like uh, if there's new algorithms that comes out, interesting algorithms that comes out and all this, uh, that's why it keeps all of us uh, very excited. Now, let's talk about a bit more about the learning then. Let's talk about how, how do we, so can you share a bit more how do you all learn, given the fact that technology, the technology that we are working with right, changes so quickly and always gets updated so fast, right? How do you all learn? How do you all pick up? Do you have any like maybe even learning resources that you can recommend as well? Huh? Eugene, you want to start first? Um, I'll address these two ways, uh, two, two points. So firstly, yes, you need to learn to stay up to date with industry. Um, what's the best way to learn? I think the best way is best way to learn is to learn something that you can apply immediately to work. That way you can see the outcome, you can get feedback immediately, you can iterate faster. No point learning TensorFlow if you're using PyTorch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, okay, so... Uh, sorry, transmission <laughs> problem. No, no point learning C if you're using Python. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I do. I think if you want to be at the edge of this field, um, you just have to devote the hours to really keeping up with the industry. I mean, the industry is moving so fast. DeepMind is releasing new paper on GAN every other time. DIPS has new papers. Spend some time to read through the papers, understand what other people are doing, um, etc. So I try to read two papers a month. Um, in my team, we do brown bags a month. Every month, everyone shares a paper. So that way we scale the learning, parallelize it, someone shares a summary, etc. Um, so that's how you need to keep up with the pace of technology. But the one thing that actually, then there's also the meta to learning. There are certain things that, are, there are certain fundamentals that are transferable across all, everything you learn. For example, code design. How do you design your code base properly so that other people can easily contribute to it, it's modularized. This applies to almost everything. Um, code style, how do you replicate research papers? 
Um, do you spend a lot of time finding data? What's the fastest way to replicating a research paper? Someone can do it in four weeks, someone can do it in four years. Um, so that is a skill that is transferable across everything you do. How do you read documentation? How do you explore a code base? For example, uh, Spark 2.4 is out, there seems to be a bug, or you don't know what's going on on the surface. How do you explore the Spark code base itself to really understand what's going on behind it? How do you Google? How do you stack overflow effectively? Um, I think these are meta skills that apply across everything, and you should always be focused on the meta skills on top of the technical um, flavor of the month uh, that, that comes along every time. Uh, ready? Uh, I would say uh, I think you should learn what you like and don't take it like a homework activity that you have to do. Oh my god, I have to learn every single thing. That is impossible. Right? And there's so much new stuff coming out every day. There's no way you can find so much time to uh, learn that in depth. So I think I would let my interest uh, guide me towards what, what is the next thing I want to learn. I also like to learn old things which is like uh, some old command in Linux which can do a job. Usually I would write Python or Java code for that, but there is usually a command which will do this. So learning stuff like this, uh, that also is very interesting. Okay, uh, to that point, right, maybe let's, let, let's, let's touch on that point. So what, so far based on learning from the older things, right, uh, what do you realize, are, what, are, what are some of the, maybe the concepts that you can still bring into to modern days then? I think every single thing. <laughs> every single thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so one way to look at it is like what is uh, small data today was big data at some point. Okay. Right. So how how do you sort a file which you cannot load into memory? Right. This is a very old problem. So if you try to read the algorithms that came up maybe seventies or maybe even older than that, and the same thing is being used in if you look at Hadoop or Spark. So, just go dig deeper. Dig deeper and see some of these things get repeated even What's in the new this? technology. I, mean, I don't think something radically new has come up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same way. Sure. Any, any learning resources to recommend for people who maybe want to take up your role? Hacker News is good. Like Hacker you News. You get a lot of good programming articles from there. Okay. There's a lot of qualities there, but the code articles that do get uploaded are nice. Uh, Reddit is also if you filter the good subreddits. <laughs> no, Reddit refuters, okay? Reddit refuters, okay. So, I, I've been used, and I've been checking Reddit since 2006. Okay. So, <laughs> so what's, what's the most common subreddit you go to? I go to programming. Programming, okay. Programming, okay. Yes. <laughs> Michael. Uh, shout out to the organizer. First place you can learn is join a Facebook group, <laughs> ASI Singapore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Obviously, we, if you look through that, we also did a research kit up of all the learning resources. That's, that's good. So, uh, so, but on a serious note, um, as, as he mentioned and as UG mentioned, a lot of your learning is based off what your problems, current problems today are. Like, hey, it's really slow. I want to try something else. Um, then you look into uh, different YouTubes, go through the different videos, talk to people, find out what's their approach and what's their problem. Because a lot of times there's no one best solution. After you learn something, something else might have come, come out and say that, oh, this is a new big thing. And it's like, is it really a new big thing? So you, you really have to take a look into it. Right? So um, that, that's a lot of the learning part that is that I, I actually agree with you. You have to learn the, how to Google really effectively and especially on Stack Overflow. If you have a unique question and you think it's really unique, how are you gonna post it up such that it's not gonna get bad? No, this is not a, this is a big question. Because I've done it a few times before, so I thought I got a really good question, but no, it's still not phrased well right now. So so that's the meta skills of like learning how to search for things, right? I think that you have to pick up over time. Okay, now. So uh, for, for my role, it's quite scientific. Uh, so I suggest people who want to keep updates uh, can ch check this website. Uh, it's called Archive. Uh, so there's a lot of scientific papers. Uh, you can just navigate to machine learning. <laughs> then you can get some updates. Or you can just uh, get the new uh, machine learning updates from the news reports. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, I think most of my updates are from uh, my working environment. For example, my colleagues are um, uh, quite active in the blogging or in the GitHub, report, uh, GitHub repositories. And uh, they will just uh, pass those new information to me before I really get it myself. Also, the head of RIT, so Rector Institute of Technology, uh, he was really active about uh, all of those new um, information, new models, new technology. He really wants to bring those new things to RIT. So every time we have all kinds of information, he also reports to us. Okay, um, I think continuing on the learning part, right? Um, I saw one question that I think I would like to ask also. And that is, I think some of us here have taken a master's, um, and I know a few of the panelists have already taken a master's, or currently taking master's, or have taken master's as well. So maybe can you share a bit more how the master's have helped uh, in your work? Uh, how the master's have helped in your work? Or if you have taken a boot camp, how that boot camp has really helped in your work? Uh, I think, um, Michael, what's that? Sure. Um, Masters program. Yeah, so I did a master's in M SMU, the MITB analytics for masters. So, first of all, uh, you need to get into the master's program knowing what you want out of it. Um, you have to have a goal before you go in. It's not a magical upgrade, right? It's like you don't just go through a course and then you suddenly a much better person. A lot of it is that you can get in touch with the academics, the, the professors. Um, the, the way I found that I got the most value out of it is that you basically have to experiment and read up on your own a lot. Then you go to the class and you test it and say that I tried this, is this gonna work? Um, and then, oh, I, I have this new approach. So there are a few times where I actually suggested some stuff and the professor's like, what's this new approach? And actually it works out quite well. And that's where you learn out of the program, I think. It's a lot of it, it's also the the people you get around with, uh, because mine, mine is a uh, physical, uh, analog, so called analog masters, you actually meet people. Um, so it's a lot of people. classmates, you interact with people from different areas, you get that experience. Because we have guys who have worked in banking in like 20 years, for 30 years, and, and their experience actually is very valuable. So that's, I think, one big uh, benefit of the masters program is that you get to be in touch with a lot of different people from different areas with varying amount of experience. And of course, you can touch with the academic side as well. I I I know I know Michael. Um, so I know Michael actually took a took a dive as in like he he resigned and then took a master's full time. So and after that, after the master's, uh, he came and looked out for a job and all this. Can you share a bit more experience of like using the masters and then looking out for jobs? A lot of things to look out for for maybe those who are taking a masters now. Yeah. Also, so, yeah. So first off, um, having a master's is just one more question that interview will ask you, so what do you do in your master's? Um, what really, really helps you is that during your master's program or whichever learning program you have, start creating a portfolio of your projects if you can uh, put them up, put them up. Um, because eventually the, the current company I got hired at, actually the, the person said, yeah, that CV looks okay. Then he clicked on the link on the profile, on, on, the, on the portfolio that I had, and said, yeah, this looks really interesting, and this looks like what we want to do. So I guess through that, if you take a deep dive and say, I, I want to take a master so that I jump from, from one role to another role, because before this, I was in market research, so quite a big difference, actually. So, so it really helps a lot if you get a portfolio up. Um, Make sure you run through enough projects that exposes you to different things, not just what you're comfortable with. So, in fact, I actually took some um, banking modules that has nothing to do with it. But I realized that, oh, this actually helps a lot. Um, in fact, when I first started my master's program, I was like thinking, yeah, procurement, not, 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 not going to be very fancy for it. What was it related to? Then the job now I have, yeah, this related to procurement. You never know what you might need in the future. I think it's good to keep a wide breath on, on your master's program. So I did a master's in computer science. Uh, if you are just working as a pro uh, programmer or engineer, I don't really think uh, uh, there's a lot of difference between a programmer who has done undergraduate versus a programmer who has done master's. 
but the main thing I learned was uh, I did like master's per research so you had to write papers and stuff. So the thing which I learned was like when you do write papers you have to spend a lot of time figuring out has this been done before and which all labs or what approach did they use, you have to cite the prior but that skill has been very useful to me. I think about yeah, things that, yeah. Now, now he reminded me that that's the same opportunity I had to read up Chinese academic papers. <laughs> Chinese <laughs> academic papers as well. Okay. <laughs> the Polish of Mandarin. So, so I, I, I agree with you. It's a good chance to look through all the academic stuff. Okay. So, Jay, you took your uh, master's full time or? Full time. Full time. So, how, how, how was it like to then after that go back to the industry again? Uh, yeah, so. It's a big story. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's take a popcorn first and yeah. <laughs> I did masters by research. I almost went into PhD. Okay. Uh, I even applied to a few PhD programs. I luckily got a job in Singapore uh, in a startup. Uh, so I thought maybe I should earn some money now and <laughs> uh, think about PhD later. And that's how I. Got. But uh, as soon as I was back in uh, industry, I, I really liked the job. So I, after that, I did it. Um, okay, so my background is in psychology, so as I was working with using data, machine learning, etc., I felt that there was a sort of a ceiling. Um, I was lacking some of the fundamentals in computer science, so therefore I decided to take a master's in computer science. I think what Michael and Jenny mentioned, the, the component about writing um, in master's, or at least I had to replicate um, some of the for example, the deep mind experiments on reinforcement learning, or had to build some very core fundamental algorithms from scratch, like alpha beta pruning or whatever. I think that is that gives you a lot of practice, a lot of rigor, and sometimes you might actually almost all the time I had to write up about my report, my findings. The ability to it really uh, hones your ability to write as well. So I think in the masters you get very structured practice, uh, get very structured feedback. Um, on terms of your programming and your writing. I think the other thing is also you learn things and you can apply it immediately at work, hopefully. Uh, almost everything you learn, you can almost find a way to apply it. So I, I think it's useful. Uh, okay, so actually Eugene took uh, a part-time master. So, so for Eugene, since you're working and taking masters at the same time, right? what is the key essential ingredients right, to help you get by day to day? Since you've got to manage both. I think the key ingredient is that I basically don't have a social life. <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay. Bad. okay, I mean, some of these modules are really tough. I think a couple of people uh, take this part-time masters with me as well. It's like 30, 40 hours a week. So my weekends are just at home. My weekdays and weeknights if I managed to get home from my startup job. I was in a startup, I'm now in a startup. Um, if I can afford some time, I'll squeeze in a lecture or two or write some code before I collapse. Um, but it's, a, it's not easy. If I had known this would be like this, um, maybe at that point in time, I would seriously have second thoughts. It's quite difficult, yeah. And your travel schedule is basically around, hey, my exams ended, let's travel. And if not, you probably can't travel much, yeah. But not to scare anyone off doing a full-time master's, is, uh, a master's is very rewarding. Yeah. Did you want to show which master's you're taking? Um, is this college in US? I don't know if you're in Georgia Tech. It's, uh, not bad computer science college. Uh, the profs are really good. The education is really good as well. Okay, okay uh, I'll touch on the next uh, question that a lot of people ask and that is, uh, okay, is PhD essential for your job role or not? Um, if so, I'll, I'll let Rina start first. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't get to talk about the master because I already have a PhD. Uh, so my PhD is in computational chem uh, chemistry. Um, I, I think it's quite necessary because um, for, for my current role, uh, because the basic knowledge has been covered uh, mostly in my, in my PhD study, 
Uh, that time I have learned like the area and the curve to analyze things and uh, to, to learn what is um, gradient descent, all of those optimization methods. Um, but if you are, um, if you want to take a PhD, um, first of all, you have to check, for example, there, there's IBM forecast and you see that five years later, what is the job market look like? Uh, maybe by the time you graduate, the, the job market has changed. Now, now I think it's uh, the demand is uh, much greater than the supply for a data scientist. Uh, and for, for recent years, still should keep this trend. But I don't know five years later. Just keep yourself updated with those forecasts and not miss a good chance. Um, master is suggested, I think, at least a tutor to the computer science. Uh, during your master, you can still like do some internship. And, uh, when you do some internship in that company, then they tend to want to recruit you if you have some decent results. Um, so that's a good chance. But PhD, um, uh, I, I don't know. Unless you you really want to take up some role, uh, like really scientific. My, my role is already scientific enough. Uh, if you want to take up my role and you come to to the interview, and if I were the interviewer. If you have bachelor or master, I think that's still okay. Uh, if you have some basic numerical uh, statistics, uh, some basic linear uh, algebra, uh, and uh, some Python coding uh, knowledge, coding ability, uh, familiar with the uh, command line interface. Uh, those are something that are basic you have to know and uh, uh, I think you, you have to have some projects that demonstrate you can really do something <laughs> to impact the company. Then that, that's enough. The degree is not so essential. I think a very different view on this. I am of the view that you don't even need a college degree to get a job. I think recently you've heard the news, Google, Apple, IBM, Bank of America, they don't even require their job applicants to have a college degree. And I, I recall seeing a list once of like the top contributors to TensorFlow or uh, the top minds in uh, data science as we call it now, most of them don't even have college degrees. The best people I've hired, self-taught, like from electrical engineering or from chemistry or from operations research, they're all self-taught. I, I, so I definitely don't think you need a master's, don't think you need a PhD. I think even without a proper college, without a proper college technical degree, you can actually learn everything yourself, thanks to the internet. Um, yeah, so that's my thing. Jody? Uh, so I would say PhD, definitely not a requirement for a data engineer role. Uh, but I am not really sure if you need a college degree or not. So. It's, I can't imagine a scenario where you don't need that education. Uh, as a programmer, if you don't know operating systems or databases, or so I think it's quite essential. Sure. Um, Michael? I don't think you need a PhD to be a business analyst. <laughs> <laughs> you have a PhD creating visual chances. Um, but then I think there are some people who do that. Um, so I guess um, back back to Eugene's questions. So for, so as you work with as a data analyst, your main customer is always your stakeholders, whether it's operations or marketing or sales or uh, C level management. Um, the business degree helps to get you the language that they're talking about. Um, that helps the masters helps you to refine your skills further, uh, put it into good use. Uh, PhD is not really that, that required in the business analyst role. Okay, so um, we move on to another um, aspect, and that is uh, actually not really another aspect, it's more of the tools. I think some of you are, are interested in what kind of tools that you all are currently using now. Uh, and uh, let's say, what is the Go to tool at least for the beginners who wants to work in the data science field. What's a go to tool that you would recommend them to pick up first? Ah, okay. Um, so um, 
Michael, why, why don't you start first? Pick up Excel first. <laughs> <laughs> I, though seriously, I've seen some part-timers come in and say, uh, could you do control C, control B? No. And then we asked her to draw a chart. She started drawing rectangles of different lengths. <gasps> <laughs> so, so, so I don't think anyone in this room is at that level so that, that you, you go that far down. Um, Excel get, get, gets you started straight up already. Um, of course, you need to start picking up SQL and all the other stuff. Uh, that's the step-by-step -step approach, I guess. There, there isn't really a, a formula for this. Okay. Um, for me, uh, just to uh, learn Python, uh, as I already told you before, Python uh, library is a Pandas uh, NumPy uh, Matplotlab. Mm, so for other things, you, you have no include. Uh, I mean, because currently machine learning uh, has some trend to things to deep learning. Uh, deep learning is part of machine learning, but uh, I mean, it's just a more powerful when you data scale is really large. So uh, since the deep learning comes up uh, so quickly, you have to learn some uh, uh, deep learning tools like high touch. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, like they are they are equally. Like a VR and Emacs thing. <laughs> It's a flow and by touch, so I, I don't really do those. They are just a platform that you can call something and they're just like the entire ecosystem you, you can run tests. Is it something like uh, you will fight each other to death uh, if one guy uses TensorFlow and the other guy uses PyTorch? No, no, it's, it's all just matrix multiplication and the chain rule. It's, it's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. 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 So, you want to add one? <laughs> okay, so. I would say uh, at the least Python okay. and uh, SQL. Yeah. Okay, SQL. So, yeah. Okay. SQL is the, it's like most data engineering jobs are moving towards completely SQL based. Okay. Really? Uh, I would I would agree with most of the panelists here. It's SQL to extract the data because you don't want to be the helpless data scientist waiting for someone to give you the data in a CSV. And Python to manipulate the data, uh, like what Weima mentioned, pandas, that probably lead to explore it. Uh, I don't even run some machine learning algorithms or not. SKLearn has really clean and easy to use API. TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, LGBM, Hyperop, there's a lot of stuff out there. Just pick what you need. Uh, you don't need to learn the whole ecosystem overnight. Yeah. I thought you were that. Yeah. I, I, and one thing, because I think work quite a few different companies is that as data analysts or BI, right, there's every time you change the different company, they might be using a different tool set all together, and you have to learn that one straight. So so if someone said Spotfire, Blue, Power BI, KickSense, uh, just learn one of them, whichever one your job currently requires. So, so that's the one you need. But I guess there's also, what I'm trying to learn now is like, what are the free options available? So that's super set. Uh, you can basically create charts on go and upload it. And you don't need to pay a single cent for that. So that helps. Okay. So tool size is Python, SQL, Excel for data analysts. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with Excel though. Uh, just okay. So I uh, will take one question from here. Uh, yeah. Any questions from the from the audience? No, I, yes. Uh, yeah. Hey, I think it's supposed to be your job, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering about the value of this uh, competition platform, such as uh, Kaggle. So do you guys uh, take participate in those kind of competitions to uh, help you improve your uh, skill? Or okay, so do you all take part in Kaggle? And if you do, right, what? Did you gain from it? Can, can, can I summarize it as that? Mostly a data science question. So, so yeah, I think I'm gonna go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh. he just said he just said it doesn't apply to him. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. I was like so focused on you. <laughs> okay. Yes, I think the uh, it's a typical case because I'm a data scientist and. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes people ask me whether if I don't have a PhD, can I join uh, your role? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so you just have to learn all the basics I just mentioned and <laughs> join some cargo computation because cargo computations are quite uh, valid projects. Those are real, uh, those data sets are cleaned by those companies and they do have some problem they want users to solve. And they provide user data, that's a very good chance. And you can uh, connect the dots that uh, everything you have learned. Uh, maybe you didn't learn everything, but you just connect everything you have learned and apply to that project. Uh, maybe after one or two projects, you have a sense uh, of what is a data science project look like, uh, whether you really like to uh, pursue this career, or after one or two projects that you have if you have something to demonstrate to the interviewer uh, what you can do, even you without a PhD. So that's a quite nice uh, platform. Okay, uh, Michael. Yeah, so Kaggle helps with if you are like a fresh grad and you didn't have work experience as like, and if in the interview asks you, do you have any experience? No. <laughs> um, so so Kaggle helps you with the data set because they really give you a problem, you just try to solve the problem. So a lot of times I think it's how you walk through that problem, how you look into it. Um, the other one for us, as in uh, visuals folks, there's also the other challenge is fast. Uh, and only if they challenge you on visualizing data, you can Google that up. That really helps you uh, because they give you data sets really and you're trying to uh, go through that aim. So it helps. I, I've tried a few and I don't think I got great results, but I think I've got great learning experience. Uh, first of all, you attempt it and then you realize the leader has a far superior method and then you realize why. So I think that's a very great experience. Okay, so continue with that. So how would they Google for it? How do you spell the word VAS or? Can I Google for it first? Yeah, I don't have my phone with me. <laughs> it's V-A-S-T. V-A-S-T. Yeah. So just look for V-A-S-T on Google, you should be able to get it. Should be, yeah. You don't, you don't get the dictionary, right? You should not be getting a dictionary, yeah? <laughs> okay, anyway, yeah. Uh, Eugene? I think this is a great question. Firstly, um, I, I think a lot of the panelists have shared about how, how Kaggle is amazing. Yes, Kaggle, you get very beautiful, clean data sets. You get to practice your machine learning skills, your ninja hacking skills immediately. And the one thing about Kaggle is that you get immediate feedback. That is important for your learning iteration cycle. You get immediate feedback and you get to compare yourself against your peers or against people who are taking part in the competition. That itself is very useful feedback. Like, hey, you know, how well do I do? If after three or four competitions, you're still in the bottom 20%, maybe you don't, maybe you probably won't enjoy this that much. So Kaggle is one, that one thing. Interesting story, I actually know of a person uh, who got hired based on Kaggle. So there was this someone who did a product categorization challenge on Kaggle. So he did a sharing at a meetup, just like this. He did a sharing at a data science SG meetup. So one of the heads of data science or one of the people at the, an e-commerce company happened to see the presentation and then they like invited him in for lunch and you know, we have a product categorization problem and we saw that, and this person, he took part in the competition, he took the effort to share the competition as well. So whenever you can go, do spend uh, an hour or two, write up your approach, blog it, share it, make it publicly available so people can know how you actually perform the challenge. They want to know your thought process. And so they invited him in, they said, you know, we saw your slides, can you present to us? So the guy presented his slides, he presented his thought process, methodology, and the next day they sent him an offer. So you can actually get a job through Kaggle, though I think this guy was probably pretty damn lucky. Yeah, honestly. Um, but then, let me add the flip side of things. Who here actively practices data science in your day-to-day -day job? Okay. How many, for how many of you, and we know as well, for how many of you is, okay, for you, is machine learning more than 50% of your job? Anyone here? Machine learning is more than 50%? You have a great job. I we need to talk. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, for how many here, machine learning is more than 30% of your job? That's cool. But so, so what you see, right, is that machine learning is a significant portion. It's the part that drives a lot of value, but it's only about 20 to 30 percent of it. A lot of it is cleaning the data. Kaggle doesn't give you an opportunity to do that. Um, a lot of it is figuring out how to join the data, understand the data, explaining your results. That's why you need to write, uh, write and get feedback. 
um, and understanding the business problem, Kaggle gives you a set metric. Is that the right metric? Yes, for the company. They've been for the company that hosted a competition, they've been doing this for a very long time. They know what metric drives actual results. A lot of times in the real world, there's no metric provided to you. So which is the right metric? That itself is also difficult. So to do that, um, you can actually get practice by working on real problems, sharing it at meetups, get feedback, and that's how you improve and you also at the same time you build a portfolio. So taking part in the Kaggle competition, right, is useful for practice. But to really build a portfolio, you need to document it, share it, either in a blog post or anything. Any sharing is better than no sharing. Okay, thank so you for question. The key here is after Kaggle, you can use Kaggle as part of your portfolio. Uh, to, to, to get the role that you need. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about, so we have, we have spent a bit of time on the on the technical um, skills. Let's talk a bit more about the soft skills. So I think one of the questions over here was, um, what kind of traits do you think are desirable for people working in the, in the role that you are in? Okay, what kind of traits is uh, uh, desirable? Uh, let's start with Michael then. Specifically, traits. Um, I guess the, the, the impo most important one you you definitely need is that you need to you you will have a lot of human time. Um, some some folks think that oh I'm gonna specialize in data analytics I I'm, I'm just gonna look at the data a lot. That's totally reverse true. A lot of time you are talking to business stakeholders, you are talking to people who, who are in operations and telling them, hey, something's wrong with your warehouse, or go fix it. Or something wrong is, is wrong in here. Uh, the first trait you need to know is that you are very comfortable presenting numbers to people, and especially in ways that they can understand it. Um, if you explain statistical terms, sure, you might get a few hits, um, but it's not going to get you a, the most of the hits. So you need to be very good at communicating. Uh, what's behind the data, how you got the analysis out. So I think that's the most critical trick I can think of. Okay. Uh, Jenny, how about for ML engineers? Say, understanding the data, how the data relates to the business of the company. Uh, so what each field means, what is the impact of that field, on the business reporting and on the, dis uh, on the data science side. So that I would choose. Uh, I would agree with Jai I would say the most important trait for a data scientist, someone who uses data, is humility. What do I mean by humility? Humility with the data. So let's say in the data dictionary you say, oh, this is primary key, this is second uh, foreign key, you just join them, and you expect your model to run well. Well, you didn't know there's a one-to-many mapping or many-to-many -many mapping, and your job breaks in production because it uses so much memory. So being humble with the data means not assuming you know about the data unless you actually dig into it yourself. This is very important for data science because you, as we know, in, in building good data science products, the secret sauce is in the data preparation, the feature engineering. Um, so being humble of the data. I think another one is being curious of the data as well, and being curious of emerging techniques. So if Python, I think like three years, four years ago, R was the thing, now it's Python, uh, next who knows what, and Spark didn't come into play like five, six years ago. So you have to be curious, you have to be disciplined to pick this up on your own, as well as apply them on your job properly. I, I think those are pretty important. Uh, for me, uh, I agree with you, Tim, because uh, the intellectual curiosity is always so much a required uh, personality for or personal uh, character, character for uh, some candidate. Because uh, even you you know the machine learning models like superficially, but then you apply it, some uh, you always want to take some insights. You want to do it better than uh, other uh, users or uh, other people, or you just want to go that one extra mile uh, than the others. So that that can make you the excellent model. Uh, another thing that I think is uh, you have to be very perseverant. Uh, some so, uh, sometimes the project is so difficult, you want to drop it in the middle, uh, but then uh, the business are waiting there. So you just have to really keep working on that until you uh, inspired by something and you get a great improvement and great impact. And that's what they look for uh, from data scientists. Uh, so, so continuing with that, right? Uh, just to share your personal experience. 
uh, how did all of you decide which role in data to specialize in? So what is uniquely interesting to your job role? I think let, let, let's just answer the first one, which is how did all of you decide which role in data to specialize in? Um, Eugene, you want to start first? Uh, that's a good question. It's a tough question. To be honest, I haven't really specialized yet. Um, my mission is just to use data to add value. If that requires me to do ETL, to do data acquisition, I'll do it. If that requires me to build the machine learning product and deploy it to production so someone can use it, I'll do it. If that requires me to write internal tooling to make it easier for junior data scientists to be more efficient, I'll do that as well. So whatever it takes to, I, I think that everyone should adopt this mindset, uh, whatever it takes for you to use the data to make impact in the most meaningful way, um, don't be afraid to take ownership of it, even though it's not your role. Hey, there's a data engineering role. I should wait for them to do the ETL for me. But you know what, if they're so busy, write some spark on your own, I think no harm or um, whatever uh, methods or processing techniques you use to process your data, make it into a package that other people can contribute to and can use. That way you make the whole team be more efficient. So, yeah, I haven't decided on the role. Okay, so uh, you're just still moving around. <laughs> yeah. Daddy? So, I would say, for me there are two uh, ways to look at it. One is a very selfish way, where I, I find that if you look at systems like Hadoop or Spark, they are very complex systems. So learning them takes a while, it's very challenging and uh, debugging issues on them is even more challenging. So just the work itself is very interesting. Yeah. Even if you don't consider about business impact or things. If you do get a role where you can work on a product which uh, lots of people use, I think the combination of two is a very, very real thing and very nice to have. So, uh, yeah, so same as Eugene actually. So um, I got started when one of my earlier jobs we received a report from a market research and then I think we all knew, knew that it's a lot of money but uh, we knew the value of, of, of it as well because the director just pointed at one number and yeah, that's the number we need. The entire deck just left that. Um, and that point, right, that's where I realized that you there is value out of creating data, um, making sure that companies utilize the data to the maximum, right? making sure that you get the most value out of it, uh, making an impact out of it, uh, not just charts and data done. So, so that's one area. But I agree with you, it's very hard to define it as a specialization because sometimes I do a little bit of ETL on my own. I have to like, okay, I have to set up a server, or sometimes I realize that, why is this guy doing uh, classification by hand? So could I do a little small data science project to do it? So I actually did it. Um, so that, that really helps this. It's a good kind of things. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's uh, uh, related to those different roles uh, in the big data or data science. So do, do you know there is a data science pyramid? Like uh, there, there are a few layers, and the, the first one on one is a software engineer who collect data, then data engineer who clean the data to pick, put them to some like um, some format you can analy uh, analyze. Then there's a data an analysis, and then there's a machine learning uh, scientist. So for me, I don't have a lot of things uh, roles that I can pick because I'm not from the uh, computer science. I can't be software engineer, and I can't like data engineer, so I just have to be data analyst or data scientist. But I, I, I just, no, <laughs> I mean, uh, for, for this uh, data science pyramid, uh, like every every level you go for, then you have, you need less people, right? So I think uh, both of us just like, not so many roles open to us, but uh, I think for those, um, every upper layer that based on this lower level, uh, lower level of the layer people. So, but I think it's also a good thing because uh, all, all of those people related can become uh, the other role. For example, if you're a software engineer and you already have the coding skill, then you can be an analyst after training. And all of those are just like ecosystems of the different uh, yeah, so And you, you can just pick freely. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's maybe take an, uh, another question from the from, yeah.
And may I know about this, uh, what uh, you guys about the uh, most challenges you have met before? Like uh, as a data scientist, you have met in few uh, people, uh, data pipeline, maybe you have made some trouble, maybe you can go for your data, or you build a model, can I achieve your metrics, like uh, you uh, kind of want to achieve 100%, what you have you got to do? And uh, uh, two que uh, another question is about, about putting that, because as I know, data science have uh, a lot of overlap in the issue, even the data engineer, software engineer, sometimes you have to overlap. How do you co uh, combine with them? Because usually you need to have a, it's, uh, some common sense in each other, the, uh, the data need to output, how do you gonna do? Okay, so let me get the question first. So what is the most challenging part of the work? Is that correct? Yes. What's the most challenging part of the work? And let's say if you are in a particular role, can, are you able to move to another role easily? Uh, how do you coordinate with the data engineers also? Okay, the coordination part. Okay, can. Uh, I think Eugene, you, you, you should, you can, you can share a bit more. Um, okay, let me answer the second question first. Coordination with the data engineers or the platform engineers or anyone else. I think I'll answer this with a programming paradigm. I mean, anyone here work with, you understand the concept of interfaces? Uh, the API, application protocol interface. So I think how we structure our teams is we work with interfaces and each interface, there's a contract. For example, I say, okay, data science will build this API, and these are the inputs it takes. This is the SLA. We can do uh, one query every 40 milliseconds. So we work with this interface. So we define all these interface ahead of, ahead of time. Data engineers are supposed to provide us this data, uh, in the, the raw data with this schema. That's our input. And then we produce a model. We produce an output, which is the interface, the API contract. And then that's how the front end team will call our model and use it. So once we have defined this interface, we can go on and develop whatever is whatever we need to do, right, on the back end, as long as we meet this contract. So that way we can parallelize our development. So that's our second that's the second question. We actually just work through interfaces, just like how you would with programming language. You call SKLAN API, you always know that it needs an X, it needs a target, etc. And pandas as a uh, the same. But the main problem is sometimes the API design, the interface is not very clear. Someone needs to come up with the interface for, uh, for each team. So it's, I mean, sometimes we will meet some problems with the API design. The interface is very important, but in the first time you do this, no one knows this API design, what it doesn't like. So, yes, I think if you are trying to push the edge, a lot of things are not quite developed yet. Uh, we, we don't quite know the best practices, but we nonetheless we do the best we can. I think there are certain interface design whereby you can have a lot of flexibility in adding new keywords or adding new um, parameters. So we try to adopt that as much as possible. Um, I think we are optimistic that whatever we build can last at least 18 months. But frankly speaking, every I, I, I would assume that every two to three years we need to do a huge refactoring or to rebuild everything from scratch. I, I think that's what we see in industry uh, nowadays as, as well. Um, on to your first question, what's the most challenging part of the world? I, I would say that um, technical issues is not a problem. Put enough time and effort into it, enough Googling or Stack Overflow, you will be able to solve it. Um, the difficult part is um, you build something, other people don't understand, they don't want to use it, how do you convince them? The, there's no right answer to that. You can do a simulation here, you know, if you did this, you can run an AD test, you show them the conversion rate went up so much, but if they don't understand, then they don't use it, okay, then you need to educate them, hey, you know, this is actually what we're doing, is math and statistics, and, but if they don't care, then you maybe need to try something else, you may need to just do some skunk works, put it into production anyway, and they're like, hey, you know what, wow, we just increased conversion last week. They're like, yeah, we put it into production, and then they're like, oh, Okay, then they accept it. A lot of times, the, the problems is getting people to understand and um, what you do, and getting them to accept it and to use it. That itself, there's no formula to it. Um, I, that's what I find the most challenging. Okay, um, I think in view of time, right? What we'll do is we'll focus on the first question. Uh, no, 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 I'm not talking about you. Yeah. Uh, get it? <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, what's, the, what's the most challenging part of your job? Uh, I would say working with other teams. 
uh, it's not a negative thing. It's like if you want to drive a change, how do you influence the other team to make it happen? So to give an example, let's say it's an e-commerce website and you want a new field to be added in your stream. Uh, so getting the front-end developers to add it in the HTML, and working with all the product managers and convincing them why this is important, uh, why you need this to be tracked. So things like this. I think these are more challenging than uh, being reactive. Like if something fails and you have to debug, that's everyday job. So you, that's not necessary. The interaction with people. Right. Michael? Um, for, for me, is sometimes you get asked questions that, like that as an ad hoc request, oh, we need to do this. And you just spend a lot of hours smashing your head on the table until something useful comes up, you're like staring at all the charts and visualizing it by every single cut possible. That's the difficult part. Then you realize that after a few years in, in it, you realize that you should not just take the request from someone and go home and do it, or go back to the desk and do it. What you need to do is make sure you ask a lot of back and forth questions. Why do you need this? After I give you this, what are you going to do with it? But sometimes you still hit the pothole where you just look at the data, nothing good comes out of it, but you still have to just go through it. Uh, the challenging part uh, of my job is just to deploy the model. Uh, you know that I don't have a lot of engineering background, so I also, the machine learning scientists now work out a lot of deep learning models, and those models really need to be backed up by machine learning engineers, but we don't have enough machine learning engineers. Sometimes my colleagues just uh, work on this engineering part, and uh, we really want to. Uh, so maybe we have to really catch up that part that we have to learn for ourselves to help deploy the models, and that's a challenging part. All right, so uh, any Questions? We'll take just one more question. Okay. We've got two. Uh, we'll take, we'll take, okay, we'll take two. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, um, so I think one of the hardest things when you're self-studying and trying to make a career change or moving into a more technical field is that you're not really sure what you want to do. Like, you're not really sure what you want to do. Like, you're not really sure what you want to do. Like, you're not really sure what you want to do. Like, you're not really sure what you want to do. Like, you're not really sure what you want to do. How do you know when you've learned enough? You know, how do you know when it's time to say, okay, I, it's time to stop studying and go get a job? Or, and I guess a second part to that, I guess an easy answer to that is apply it. And once you get a job, that's when you know. But kind of a, a follow-up question is, you know, there's data scientists, but that it seems like kind of a high achievement. But are there you know, are there lower levels of data science? You know, are there junior data scientists like? Kind of, you know, what are the rungs that you know where you can get into the profession? I guess is my question. Okay, uh, you want to specifically target the question to any of the panelists, or I'll, I'll choose for you. Uh, whoever, whoever thinks they have an answer for it. Okay, because in view of time, I think it's good to just maybe get about two plus two of the panelists. Would you like to choose the two? Um, how about? Okay, okay, you did. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ku. Uh, yeah. I would say there's a very easy uh, solution to your question. How do you know you're good enough? Um, you find someone who is in a position you want to be, and you talk to them and ask them, "Hey, I know this, I know that, I know this, I know that. Am I good enough? Um, if not, what am I missing? What are the key skills that I need to be a data scientist? What do I need to learn? Do I need a master's? Do I need a PhD? What are the biggest challenges you face?" I think by virtue of the fact that you are attending this meetup, you already know that that is the way one way to answer the question. So, when I was trying to be a good data scientist, what I would do is I would meet, I would interview, um, not interview at companies, but I would interview heads of data science or rock star data scientists. Um, anyone here know Xavier Conrad, chief data scientist at uh, Data Robot, Kaggle Master for many years running. I would ask him, hey, you know, what does it take to be a good data scientist, a rock star data scientist? The peers around you, who among them are good? Why are they good? Um, you find it a lot of times, right? It's not because they are a Python ninja or SQL master. A lot of times is they can apply the technical skills and get it to create value for the company. The model gets into production and gets measured. So I would say that. Ask them what it takes to be good enough, and then check against your your own 
skills inventory, whether you have it or not. So, uh, thank, yeah, thank you for the question. So for, for me, I think the, uh, for, if you're taking some course, for example, master or PhD or uh, even undergraduate, the, the best uh, suggestion is for you to take some internship in some company before you graduate. But if you're just t uh, looking for some big career change, uh, that's also possible uh, after you uh, finish some projects. For example, you follow the two kind of competitions and you finish those projects. Um, then, like you just said, most <laughs> the best idea is to show some of those, um, some of the people already in that row. Uh, okay, I have done two projects, and this is how I did it. And let me correct you. Uh, okay, so for my row, uh, people mostly do uh, like this and not like yours. So that's the most efficient way for you to capture yourself uh, the the toolkit to suit for that company, and also different the same type of, for different company. They may be assigned a different, uh, totally different uh, job, and maybe there are different requirements for a toolkit. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, if you learn uh, Python, maybe they require R. If you learn like a C plus plus, and that's a lot of effort. Then maybe they require Python. Uh, so don't learn too much things in the beginning. Just uh, have to have have a look of that job description and talk with that person. Uh, in the company or not in that company or you, you know someone else in the other company uh, similar role you can just like mm, connect them to, to add a bit on to that I would say that you are probably good enough if you can build a product and deploy it on your own server and just take that on your phone hey you know I built this is it cool and some, if someone says it's pretty cool that's a great portfolio right there so if you can do that at least you have done it end to end you found data you put a model, you deploy it on some cheap uh, cloud server, spot instance, and someone can actually touch it, someone can feel it, and there's a basic UI, I think that's good enough. Um, for me to act right would be uh, be very active in the community and look for mentors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like Eugene, uh, Kaising over there, uh, these are some of the mentors you can approach. Uh, we now so, yeah, okay, yeah. Last question. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I just want to, I'm quite curious about this because my leader told me like data science is different from engineering. The most important reason is engineering projects can always be successful as long as you pay enough effort and time and money and some, some, something like that. But data science projects can fail. Uh, they can fail because of very different reasons. Like maybe the assumption is wrong, maybe your data is not good, maybe the bidding side you don't accept it. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you have some very impressive failure experience in the data science career? <laughs> so I'm asking for the two data scientists. Okay, um, maybe Jelly want to add? Yeah. I haven't worked as a data scientist, so I don't have any experience. Actually, Jelly yeah. doesn't fail. So. <laughs> <laughs> but as an engineer, I have failed maybe hundreds of times. Okay. Uh, there was one time when I pushed a single line of config change wow. and it brought down a 500 node hurdle cluster. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But at, at least that's something you can put in your resume and tell people I've failed a 500 node. I don't put it on that. <laughs> but, yeah, that, but that's a good story to tell, right? <laughs> yeah. okay. so, uh, I mean, I don't know if you recall the guy that brought down AWS. There was one time AWS just went down, all the, the entire internet went down. But AWS didn't fire him. They said, hey, you know what? Can you prevent this from happening next time? So I think that failure is not, um, failure is actually a point for learning. For me, I failed 10 times for one success I've had, at least. Um, for my, some of my previous teammates uh, in my previous role, they, they, every time they see me with a grumpy face, they know, Hey Eugene, A/B testing not going so well, huh? <laughs> so for every because and like like what you said, uh, data science is very ill-defined. Software engineering is a very mature craft. It's a very mature discipline. Um, you have very good uh, design patterns to solve very standard problems, or at least they they made a, they've done a good job making it very standard. For data science, we have uh, classification, regression, reinforcement learning. Um, but even among those, there's still a lot of different patterns that you will see, there's GAN, et cetera. So you're right, data science is partly research, that's what makes it difficult, but that's what I find makes it, makes it fun as well. 
Uh, my most impressive failure, I think, there was once I ran an A-B test, um, and uh, people found out, and they were like, hey, you know, they asked my boss, hey, why is your data scientist running A-B test that costs us um, hundreds of millions in revenue? And I'm like, okay, shit, I'm gonna be fired. But I didn't. Um, I just came up with a plan. Okay, the A-B test didn't do so well. Here is my hypothesis of why it didn't do so well. Here is how I'm gonna investigate it. Here is when I'm gonna tell you my investigation. Here is how I'm gonna improve the model. And here is when you see the next A-B test. Um, so I, I think the more failure, the better, man. It actually helps you improve. Okay, um, so in view of time, right, I think we will uh, have just one more uh, last question. And the last question will be, for those who want to join your role, right, what's the key piece of advice you give them to join, to join, uh, to take up your role? So, uh, yeah, I'll let Eugene start first then. You mean to... To take up... Be my role or... Yeah, to be your role, to be your role. I would say... Um, two things. Practice, and through your practice, you get a portfolio. I mean, I don't know how many of you here renovate your own house or your family's renovating your house. Would you hire a contractor that has no portfolio? Probably not. So that's why you need a portfolio. It could be a blog, um, it could be a something on GitHub, it could be a Kaggle composition with a nice write-up, it could be some website. A portfolio is important. And if you can actually develop that portfolio, it shows that you have practice. So just get a portfolio and you have taken care of the rest. Okay. Yeah, so as Eugene said, I think GitHub it's like a very, very important GitHub or any open source project. So you can uh, find like, so many projects are there. You can find the project that most is most interesting to you and try to make small changes in that. So with small patches, then you have a lot of senior developers looking at your code. Uh, so that way you can improve a lot. Okay. Okay. Mike? Um, I, I agree with you, Eugene. You need to get a portfolio going. Um, it doesn't have to be work, it doesn't have to be a Kaggle data set. Some of my friends say that I like Magic the Card Carrying, so he did his own visualizations on that. It's really fantastic. Um, the other part is try to volunteer your time off and then get. If, if you still feel that your portfolio is not enough, you can actually start talking to random companies and say that I can do this for you, or what's your biggest problem, and then you start talking to them. Um, that, that's one area I think you can start off with. Yeah. Um, um, there's a great uh, organization in Singapore called Data Kind SG. It's an NGO that helps other NGOs make use of their data. I, I used to volunteer that I don't have time now. But if you want to get your hands dirty with real life messy data, like really, really messy, among other experts who can provide guidance and training in a two day hackathon or data dive or whatever, that is the place to go. Thank you for both of you provide such a great chance for us to practice data cleaning. Um, okay, so for, for my role, I think the most important thing is you can uh, have some decent, uh, um, some degree to demonstrate that you know the basic knowledge or you take some MOOC, uh, those online courses to demonstrate you have the basic knowledge. Um, plus that, you, you need to demonstrate some projects you've done and because we really want to see those people can can do something, can impact the businesses. Okay, so, uh, okay, so to summarize is be able to demonstrate uh, that you know how to apply whatever that you have learned. Uh, okay, so uh, that being said, uh, thank you very much for the panels, uh, panelists to be here. Uh, thank you, Eugene, thank uh, you, Michael, and uh, Rina. Okay. Now I have to fulfill my last obligation and that is uh, any of you are looking to hire, your organization is looking to hire? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm looking to hire. Okay. Uh, if you're really interested in health tech, using data to improve health, um, talk to me uh, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, data engineers, yes. Data engineers. Okay, so for, for Jedi, it's data engineers, huh? Okay, Michael. <laughs> Um, we are also looking out for people who can work well with data. So it's, we are looking for hybrids. So uh, it could be like, I only learn uh, data, you yeah, mixed between BI and data engineering, or you're mixed between data science and BI is also great. But yeah, we are looking out for clients. Okay, yeah, Reina? Uh, 
So I T U Singapore also want to hire some data scientists. Actually, uh, just knowing that I, I have two panelists, um, our HR team also followed me here today. So if you want to <laughs> talk with them uh, later uh, after this. Okay, uh, maybe the HR team want to... Uh, yeah, oh, okay, so wait, yeah, just wait. Okay, wait. So, uh, thank you very much for spending your time here. I hope the uh, panel discussion has been fruitful for you. You gain a lot more information from that. Um, so, with that being said, thank you very much for coming down here. Also, a big thank you to our sponsor for the venue. Yes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so the panelists will still be around. Uh, so, if you want to ask them, Questions, right? Please uh, stay back and uh, talk to them. Just go around, yeah. Okay, great. So, thank you very much. Thank you.